Hello and welcome to this Brexit transition slash supply chain risk management podcast. Uh, My name's Steve Dunkley. I hope you're safe and well as countries around the world either start to come out of lockdown or reintroduce measures to contain spikes of the coronavirus. So while the spotlight for the last four months has rightly been on the pandemic, the transition period for Brexit approaches. And today I'm pleased to have a customs clearance leader, a supply chain director slash analyst, and one of the UK's most distinguished experts in risk management. So thanks for joining us, Robert Hardy, Julia Graham, and Guy Dunkley. Good day to you. Hi. Hi. (laughs) So we're going to have a conversation around not only what companies need to be doing to be customs ready for the 31st of December, but explore some of the key issues facing the executives responsible for supply chain and risk and sort of the mitigation strategies that they can adopt and how they can apply innovative solutions to move forward with confidence. So first of all, I'm pleased to welcome Robert Hardy, uh, the founder of Customs Clearance Consortium and a director of Oakland Invicta and managing partner of Paradox Consulting. Now, Robert, a large part of your career is spent ensuring that the trucks move quickly and efficiently through the ports, and you've worked at companies like Eurotunnel and P&O, and I've actually been enjoying watching your own breakfast podcasts. Uh, I recall watching a recent edition where you remind us that now we're out of the single market, declaration processing will be with us regardless as to whether the UK makes a free trade agreement with the EU or not. And so we're looking at over 200 million declarations processed per year, Um, So it'd be great if you can, first of all, answer the knee-jerk questions of uh, isn't the processing of all these declarations going to be impossible and isn't it going to be expensive for companies and won't there be just a queue of lorries either side of the channel? They're they're very good questions and they're they're questions that come up an awful lot. I mean, I've always been involved in the sort of border process and including customs clearance and until 2017, I actually ran the customs terminal at the port of Dover. So we we kind of took a view on it a long way out saying that, look, I understand customs clearance is complicated and it can be expensive to do a customs entry. We're not talking about traditional customs entries here. We're talking about European customs entries, which tend to be relatively simple, very repetitive, where once you've done one full load of furniture, the only difference between that and the previous one was the package's weight and value. Now that, that means you can do a customs declaration, honestly, in under a minute, and particularly if you've got good data flows. So we've concentrated on data. We've concentrated on keeping everything flowing smoothly and as much as possible also concentrating on relocating the border, either virtually or physically, either with inland clearance stations or with customs processes that allow you to do the documentation retrospectively. So on the whole, if we just look at supplies into UK, 95% of those will be very smooth under customs rate simplified procedures, and there should be no major issues if everybody gets the basics right. Uh, Exports are more of a challenge, and I suppose we'll cover that a little bit more later on. But if you work out what the process is, you'll be absolutely fine. If you don't follow the process, you're going to have problems. Our, our issue, I guess, always is preparedness of traders. And still, I saw recently the figures were 60% are unprepared, that we're getting really close to the line here, guys, and to not be prepared at this stage, it, it, this is, you're moving into self-harm territory here, is that there is no reason why you shouldn't be prepared. Uh, we've made it really clear. We've been chasing master data, background data, for uh, about the last six months, and it is a fight. It's a real fight to get basic information that will allow us to do the entries in an automated fashion from day one. And it shouldn't be as hard as it's been. Mm. So basically you're trying to communicate, get the message out there to those that are engaged in import and export. And um, in terms of the cost, I was talking to the COO of Innocent Drinks, James Davenport, last week, and he said that the uh, the cost for this declaration process, they've valued at about £1.5 million. And what's your... The £32.50 was originally said by John Thompson, who was the CEO of HM Customs Excise at the time. This was in the Treasury Select Committee and it was about two years ago. And this figure suddenly appeared, 200 million declarations at £32.50 equals a a telephone number. That's old fashioned. That's not that's not what a declaration costs. It is if you're going to do a port declaration, but there are better and easier ways of doing that. And because it's metronomic flows. So what you have is the goods coming in through Dover, for example. The goods will come in and you do the customs entry later on, which is a consolidated customs entry. Why are we quoting a customs declaration charge 
and there isn't a customer declaration We've got day rate for some customers where they've actually got such such regular flows that we can actually say we will do all of your customers paperwork for this figure so i think to be sitting there at 32 pounds 50 a declaration it's just unimaginative but within that same press release it also said that we require 50,000 customs agents because the customs agent could do 20 entries a day it wouldn't last five minutes if you could only do 20 entries a day we're talking about with automation we're up to about 150 an hour per robot so this figure of 20 declarations a day at 32 pounds 50 is just old-fashioned it's just the wrong way of looking at it I completely agree if that's a, a box from Shanghai coming into Felixstowe, that's a complicated process. But a full load of yogurt, which is the same as yesterday's full load of yogurt, isn't going to take you very long. Okay, good stuff, good stuff. Well, thanks for clearing that up. No, that's okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also pleased to welcome Guy Dunkley. Um, by the way, Guy and I are not related, but we do share a pretty, pretty cool family name. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, so Guy is a supply chain professional. You, you spent a big chunk of your career in the telecom space, uh, managing the yep. procurement and movement of consumer handsets. And before the telcos, you were with KPMG and as advisor, as well as AMR Research, which is now part of Gartner as an analyst. Um, so you've, you've pretty well supply chained up, as it were. So yeah, uh, I guess supply chain directors at the moment with COVID and now Brexit are having to rethink their just-in-time supply chains and the commercial terms of supply, so the INCO terms. And then there are sort of the other financial considerations relating to tax and supply chain risk. So tell us, what you're, tell us what you're seeing through the lens of the supply chain director at the moment. Well, I think where we stand now is this is part of a witch's cauldron of really difficult issues confronting supply chains. So Brexit is a headache in and of itself, but on top of COVID, the changes to the, of what people are buying, the channels through which they're buying, the dangers that um, companies have in relation to the financial viability of their supplier base, throw on top of that issues in relation to the US and China, and changes in factor input prices like petrol, this really is a, a perfect storm. Ultimately, viewed in that way, what you can't have is a separate risk approach to COVID, to Brexit, to this, to that. Ultimately, you've got to consolidate some of that together and look at what the most appropriate responses should be. As we talk about Brexit and listening to the issue of preparedness, I think even if you as a supply chain director feel you've sorted yourself out, you're, you're as good as the weakest link in your supply chain. And identifying which of your suppliers represents your biggest risk within this change to Brexit, I think is probably the, the big headache. The, the second point that I'd make is everyone sees the 1st of January as the final point. It's just the start point. Um, there will be further negotiations with the EU. There'll be further negotiations with other bodies. At every stage in the changes to not only the transaction costs that were outlined, but equally to the tariff structure, it changes your calculation on what you buy and where you buy it from, whether you make it yourself, whether you still purchase it. So rather than see this as a, a one-off exercise in terms of looking at the risk and re-evaluating your supply chain network, I think this is just the start point. Excellent, Guy. Thanks very much for that. And finally, Julia Graham, great for you to be with us today. I've known you for several years as an editorial contributor to the FDE magazine and events that I used to run, both when you were the director of risk management and insurance for the law firm DLA Piper and your current role as deputy CEO and technical director of AMIC. Uh, which is the risk association that broadly represents the risk officer and insurance procurement executive from the FTSE 350 type company. And so obviously I'm be intrigued to hear what you think about what Guy just said and, and what Robert said as well. But um, you just launched your annual survey report on the top risks and mega trends. I, I guess that it went through quite a few changes along the way as COVID struck, but uh, tell us about some of the key trends and the extent to which supply chain risks and the risks associated with Brexit were up there. Hello, everybody. And yes, uh, you're absolutely right. We produced a survey report at a very interesting time. 
uh, globally and, of course, in the UK. I think the sort of couple of general things I would say in the context of all of that is, is that in the days gone by, when organisations would look at risk, they tended to produce nice lists of risks or what some people will call a risk register. And these were your sort of top 10 or top 20 or even more in the case of some organisations of the things that you presented to your board that you felt um, they should, should keep them awake at night and, and in many cases often did. And you treat those risks individually and you'd look at what the controls should be and you'd look at where they were before the controls and after the controls and you'd rank them very neatly. Um, and you'd look at them in terms of their impact and you'd look at them in terms of their likelihood. And that's all fine stuff except uh, what we're now experiencing in the world is a real shift in the way that people must look at risk. And the reason for that shift is the sheer connectivity or connected risk, as some call it, that none of these risks typically will operate in isolation. So if you take something like supply chain, which we've been talking about uh, up until now, supply chain risk doesn't operate in a vacuum. It, it's affected by all the other risks that are happening around it. And as we've seen in the experience with the pandemic and in our experience that's uh, coming along in the very near future and that we're preparing for with the final period of transition, is that these risks are also intimately affected by the implications of Brexit. And I think there are a couple of things I would say there. One is you have to take your risks, your top 10 and your top 20 or whatever they are. But then I would suggest what you need to do is to overlay them with issues that are ongoing in the world. And I'll give you an example of what that might look like. If you took the financial crash of 2008 and you overlaid the implications of that on your risk register, you would typically find around about 30 to 35% of those risks being affected. Do the same thing with something like COVID-19 or Brexit, and you will find that that percentage is much higher. We've been privileged to uh, have some very interesting work done by the consulting arm of Aon, uh, looking at the overlay of COVID-19, and their research concluded that if 35% was the typical overlay for uh, the financial crash, the typical overlay for COVID-19 might be about 70%. So it's no surprise, given the connecting factors of COVID-19, the severity that the world is now facing from that risk. It touches everything, people, economies, um, you name it, it touches it, supply chains included. Do the same thing with Brexit and you'll find some similar consequences. So I tend to sort of suggest to organisations that you don't look at Brexit as a risk and you don't look at the pandemic as a risk. What you look at is how those risks and issues touch other risks because that shows you how much your business is infected by these issues. It gives you an idea of the implications of them and it does allow you to line them up and look at the aggregated effect because, of course, um, they are cumulative and therefore organisations, as we can now see, are facing the challenges not only of Brexit but of COVID-19 and you need to look at those in the context of something like supply chain. And the impact when you look at that is much more severe than if you looked at supply chain in, in isolation. I think the other thing I'd just say before I finish on this part is look at the speed, the velocity of change in the world. You know, if I, we have to publish a report frequently um, because the world changes so fast. And what people identified as being the top issues, um, you know, maybe even just a year ago, are not the top issues that people face today. And I, my organisation produced a report on complex supply chains. It was only in October last year. Normally, when we produce a report like that, a thought leadership piece, we can perhaps leave that there as current for a couple of years. It's only July, and we are already updating that report um, with the implications of what the world has faced. So velocity, connectivity, you cannot look at things in isolation. 
are some of the big ticket issues of the day. And that makes it a lot more complicated, uh, both for the risk professionals, but for everybody else who are their peers, and particularly for the people who are non-exec directors trying to uh, govern these issues at a board level. Their job is a lot more complicated today than it was even a year or two years ago. Wow, great insights there, Julia. You know, moving away from the piecemeal to the sort of systems thinking approach, obviously it links up with what Guy said as well. But looking more practically now, Robert, we've heard about sort of these supply chain challenges and risks that that the companies are facing. Um, What's your practical advice for companies that want to minimise delays when they import from the EU, for example? Well, number one, get an EOR number. It is a five-minute job. It is your reference number that allows you to talk to customs in your territory, and yet we still find people who don't have them. So it really is step one, get an EOR number. They always th- they, we always then say step number two is classify your goods. This is the kind of customs mantra. So EOR number, classify your goods and understand the value. Now start to look at the customs classification of your goods and the valuation of your goods. You're 80% of the way there by having those, those four elements boxed off. That, then you're just down to process. And, it, and if you're down to the actual process of what boxes need to be ticked in what, in what order, yeah, there, there is, there's some very good training involved. And I actually recommend a lot of people do the training even if they're not intended to do the documents. If you're importing from the EU to the UK, if, for example, you're importing widgets from Germany, um, the, the processes will change. I mean, uh, today you have a situation where your widget supplier in Germany will invoice you without VAT because of the reverse charge system. Um, that, that doesn't require a mass of paperwork. It's, a, it's an export declaration from Germany and an import declaration in the UK, which can be done belatedly. So the, the one that doesn't yet have an owner in terms of the process is INCO terms. It doesn't get enough attention. Uh, It's not well understood. And it's particularly prevalent because of the EU trade already exists. And now you add complexity. Let's say goods are are invoiced on a delivered price basis. So the exporter is delivering them right the way up to the buyer's door. And now you add duty to it. The argument is, well, who's going to pay that duty? And suddenly you can fall, fall into a situation where the goods are now delivered duty paid. Or there is duty to be payable. If there is any duty, we don't know until probably just before 11 p.m. on the 31st of December. It's literally, we just don't know. But if there is duty, there is a liability and a responsibility for that duty. And it's not necessarily the importers who you might think is the importer. So that, that's the biggest part for me is understand your income terms and if you're in the basis of of delivered duty paid or if you're dealing with x works these may require foreign vat registration in order to still be capable of working in a post-brexit environment um, and it's it's the area that doesn't get enough it doesn't affect customs too much it affects the customs process but in so much as who is the importer but from customs planning point of view there is an importer therefore there is an import entry uh, it's the inco terms that decide who that is and because of that customs don't necessarily focus on inco terms very strongly because they, they don't need to the border don't concentrate on inco terms and in the eu trade they don't really exist goods are either delivered or collected when you layer in the complexities of inco terms and the pitfalls that are associated with them that's where I'd start. We have the solutions because we now know what the processes are and and how to line the ducks up. But the problem is when somebody says, I have the situation, what is the solution? My next question is always, what are the INCO terms? And invariably the answer is, what are you talking about? I have no idea what you're talking about. And if they don't know what INCO terms are, honestly do not know how to pitch the solution because it is dependent on the INCO term. So, Guy, we, talk, we talked about that the other day, actually, INCO terms, and uh, I guess yep. the, it's a big battleground now for who's going to be liable and responsible. So, tell us your thoughts on that. So, you know, picking up, and, and I hear everything that Robert said and would, would heartily agree, that is a discussion between purchaser and supplier that has to be bottomed out definitively against all of the goods that are being supplied. And of course, you know, we keep on talking about import. There is export as well that needs to be covered. Our immediate concern is always about bringing goods in, but we sell a lot of goods to the EU, as everyone knows. That equally has to be bottomed out in relation to UK suppliers selling into Europe. 
I guess my concern, as Robert has talked about, is if you multiply through the variables that he's talked about, which is number one, a degree of understanding, multiplied number two by the ease of the system, which may be easy, number three by the take up. Once you've multiplied these things together, you're still in a position where you're not clear that on day one, it is all going to be hunky-dory and everything is going to come through okay. So we can say it's understandable. Fundamentally, it's easy. But if people aren't making the effort to understand, if they are not signing up, and again, it could be your supplier's supplier, you still have to engage with a degree of risk assessment and reaction to that. We are in a position where the clock is ticking and companies have got to come up with their own view in relation to the the, the classic strategies to allay risk, whether that's building up inventories, whether that's reshoring, whether that's building up greater internal capabilities to do all of the transactional stuff that, that Robert has talked about. I'd like to add a couple of things on on the whole issue of supply chain. When we looked at supply chain late last year, we could see, obviously, that organisations want lean and efficient supply chains that bring down costs and provide maximum value, natural desire for low-cost networks. However, we picked up a tendency for a couple of things. um, And I've seen this emerge a little bit with our experience post the pandemic as well. Um, I would call it turning the blind eye, or perhaps we we should say an overdose of wishful thinking. And listening to my fellow speakers, I think one of the reasons people are still unprepared or underprepared for the implications of Brexit is that people think it would be okay. And I think also, you know, when when organisations look at these issues around the boardroom table, They tend to focus on the things that they're comfortable with, that they can easily identify. And when people say with a wishful thinking approach, yeah, it's all okay. We we know where our supply chain is. We know things will be okay. There is a tendency to nod sagely and say, great, we really appreciate the reassurance. But I think the challenge is that the concentration of risk that was building up, um, both as a result um, of uh, Brexit And we clearly saw this after the impact of the pandemic, that concentration of risk, which could result in some real failures in the supply chain, where people had taken this, what I call, wishful thinking approach. Um, And I think, therefore, it has led to some organisations underestimating the impact of these issues on their supply chain. Uh, We saw that Uh, supply chain as a risk in itself go a little bit higher up the uh, hierarchy when we did our survey this year. But, you know, I think that's partly not because people thought the issue had gone away. I just think other things came in and pushed it a little bit further down the list. Uh, And again, um, people not only tend to deal with things they're comfortable with, but they also tend to deal with things that are in the front of their nose. So you deal with the pandemic because it's there and it's got to be managed. You deal with Brexit because it's there and it's got to be managed. A lot of organisations deal with supply chain when it fails and it's not there. Um, So again, I I would um, encourage organisations to keep this wide angle view of risk, um, to rely on what they do based on fact and objective uh, information. There's some great methodologies out there for mapping your supply chain. They're not new, but they're very good and they can be quite sophisticated and to move away from the wishful thinking and it won't happen to us syndrome. And Julia, in terms of insurance, what are the options there? Uh, When you actually understand where your links are, you can start to think about insurance and and whether that's the fact that you need insurance for things like trade credit or whether you need to uh, bolster your protection because you've got a dependency on a certain number of properties or um, a certain number of issues that are vulnerable, for example, to cyber attacks, um, you can only really start to work out what you want to ensure when you've actually understood the risks. Of course, some of these risks today, um, and this has been true of the last three decades, the um, change in the balance between tangible and intangible risks has been uh, incredible. 
Um, and most organizations these days, the vast majority of their assets are tied up in the intangible value, not tangible value. Intangible value is by definition much harder to quantify and much harder to ensure. And therefore you really have to be on the ball in managing those risks and you've got to understand them. Tangible risks, a bit easier to place insurance for. You might say, well, that's not too true with things like trade um, in insurance. Although there is a, a newly introduced government-backed scheme, it's only a temporary arrangement, it's not a permanent one, but there are some schemes available for you uh, once you've understood where your uh, weaknesses are and what you want to do about them. Um, and I think, finally, the one thing I would um, say, which um, always, again, sort of amazes me, that when people look at their supply chains, they don't understand what commitments they've sometimes made uh, when they're a supplier or, or receiver of goods or services, check the contracts. What are you committed to? What did you say you would do? And then make sure that you understand those issues and that you're prepared for them. Um, because I think one of the big frailties of what we're seeing is that when something does go wrong, organisations have not been as well prepared as they might have been to deal with the crisis that ensues. And so a lot of organisations that haven't understood where their weak spots are, when they've been exposed, they've floundered around a little bit um, by events going wrong in terms of how they react and, and what they need to do. So crisis management, absolutely key for any organisation, for any risk, but especially for supply chain. And maybe to build on that, it's the ability to sense and respond. So a number of the risks uh, have precursors, whether it's a customer who's delaying payments a little bit more um, your mm. ability to corral all of that data and yeah. identify early trends I think is going to come as a premium yeah I completely agree with you if you don't do horizon scanning and you don't have um, a good risk radar and some metrics that you're trying to measure how do you know when things are going wrong and they can go wrong very fast but actually some of the most dangerous risks don't go very fast. And I would call Brexit what I would call a, a creeping risk. You know it's there, but you don't deal with it. I think the pandemic, um, the way it evolved, what took many organisations by surprise is not that they thought this might happen. What took them by surprise was the scale uh, of its spread and the speed at which it spread. And how many crises have you dealt with that have lasted six months? Um, it's the crisis that keeps on giving. Most crises happen, you deal with them, and then you work out what you want to do. This is very unusual because this is a crisis for many companies. Uh, they're still in crisis. They haven't left the crisis stage yet. And that, that's very unusual in, in the whole area of crisis management. Wow. That's a really good insights, Julia. I mean, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll, well, we'll sort it all out soon. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be disbanding my crisis management team just yet. Um, mm. and, and I would be keeping, I, I think, the very wise comments about um, having a radar of what might be creeping up on you and monitoring that continuously. A risk register that you put on a boardroom table once a year is not the way to do that. Mm. Is it, can I just jump in? There's a very good point that you, you, you both touched on exports and risk and uh, I can't avoid the opportunity to raise one that most people is not on their radar, is that if you export goods from the UK to, uh, to anywhere in the EU, but let's say it's not to the country that you're shipping to. So if, for example, the vehicle is going from Dover to Calais, the goods are for Germany, the ultimate customs clearance takes place in Germany. And you need a transit document to allow you to pass through Calais through Belgium, through Holland, into Germany, where the ultimate customs clearance will take place, hopefully. If you fail to customs clear those goods at the intended final destination, the person who issued that transit document becomes liable for the June VAT that should have been paid. They're not ready for that one, I have to say, but it is a legitimate risk, and it's not on anybody's radar, or not on enough radars. And I think it points to the need for supply chain and tax to get around the table um, mm. comprehensively across all of these transactions and all of the taxation implications, whether it is duty, whether it's inward processing relief, outward processing relief, these transit mm. issues, 
they all come together. And the danger in the past has been the tax people are seen as these distant figures in head office who nobody really knows and no one really engages mm -hmm. with. But as Robert points out, the sting in the tail will surely come if you don't get those people together early. Mm. I, I'd like to add from a, a risk management point of view too, when we were looking at this and just make the point that the supply chain relationships you've been talking about aren't linear. They're a web. Mm. And I think one of the challenges um, I've seen people come across is that different tiers of suppliers may be supplying each other uh, and the actual parent organisation might not be aware of those linkages. And the complexity isn't because you've got a lot of suppliers, although that doesn't help. It's actually the relationship be between the suppliers, manufacturers and customers that create the real challenge. And so if you don't look at things in the way that you've both described, and you don't look at that sort of uh, network of what you've got, um, you're in big trouble. I, th I think that's an excellent point about the, the web rather than linear. And of course, I was asked recently, what's the difference in the process between a deal and a no deal end of transition period? And actually, as a customs intermediary, no deal's a bit easier. Uh, there's yeah. duty to manage, but there's actually less paperwork. If, yeah. you, if you end up in, a, in an FTA environment where you, there would have to be the rules of the free trade agreement and suddenly rules of origin kick in bells on. And then your, your web supply chain, you're into culmination, accumulation rather, and, and what is the origin and how do you identify that yeah. origin? Yeah. And that is a minefield. So I'm kind of a no deal guy, you know, just let me have a nice straightforward <laughs> declaration and let's get this done. Because it, what, what you save with one, you replace with more complexity. Yeah. Luckily, it's pre-declaration pre stage because it's not going anywhere till the third of origin is done. But, you know, the, the, there isn't a solution to this problem. It's not going to go away. It's, mm. it's now, it's now up, to, up to people to identify what are the threats and the weaknesses in all of this and how yeah. they can focus on opportunities that are there they are there are there they are there are opportunities there you have to yeah. go, they're not jumping up at you but they are there um, yeah. and you've just got to manage the, the risks yeah. at the same time i think so well do you know Rob, I, I absolutely completely agree with you and sort of some of the most innovative and, and let's face it during times of stress and change that is when man is at his most innovative hmm. um, and pandemics are included there's uh, there's some very good research that indicates that previous cases of pandemic, and we have had them before with SARS and MERS, is that that's when organizations and people are at their most innovative, but it's also a time when organizations cut the innovation fund and spend it on process. Um, and we, what I've seen with Brexit, some of the most innovative solutions are people saying, okay, we won't try and solve uh, the problem, we'll write our own solution. So I saw a ladies' clothing manufacturer, quite a famous one in the UK, who imported printing, printed fabric from France. And the CEO um, said, well, OK, that's going to cause us a real problem. So we'll import plain bales of cloth, we'll buy a printing machine and we'll print it ourselves. And we'll create our own supplies and take it out of the supply chain altogether. And that's what they did. And I was really impressed because it is quite a traditional business in terms of what it sells um, but the innovation of thinking in a different way of solving a problem I thought was very impressive and, and, and I, I think that's right but all, also to build on that I think there is equally a risk of overreaction or wrong reaction to the extent that people take decisions on their supply chain network and where they make things and reshore things, if, as Robert's view of the future pans out, that life's really pretty easy and you've just moved everything onshore and it's a hell of a lot more expensive and your competitors haven't, you've exposed your company to a lot of risk in and of itself. So I think there's a lot of the discussion is around how do I mitigate risk? How do I mitigate risk? How do I onshore? I think it does require a little bit of thought and a little bit of care around the sorts of things that you're going to do against the possibility that life isn't quite as bad as people are projecting or indeed quite as good as they're projecting. I, I think you're right. I think what, what you find in a lot of these, a lot of these processes, though, is that 
is that supply chains have evolved over time and Brexit cre creates this reboot button. And it's, I think for some, it's been quite cathartic. For others, it's just been almost putting their hands up and saying, well, that's the end of me. I've had a good run. You know, and yeah. we're seeing both reactions, to, to be fair. Some that are really embracing it and thinking this is an opportunity to excel rather than a threat. But equally, there's, a, there's an equal number who are running for cover of trying to ignore it in the hope that it might just go away or somebody else will make yeah. it. Uh, what, what I'm seeing perhaps in, in the best practice are those companies that are not seeing it as a single hit of a reset button, but are yes. thinking that's a button I'm going to have to hit in, on multiple occasions over the next few years. So yeah. that's going to become something that I'm going to get really, really good at. The ability to remodel my supply chain based on whatever the outcomes of Brexit, the pandemic, various other things could be. So I think it becomes less of a, oh, I'm going to have a look at this once every five years, dust off, you know, get someone from the outside to, 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 to run a, a simulation and more of a continual process as things become clearer. Yeah, I guess the key thing is to be agile, flexible. One of the things I wanted to ask you, Robert, you know, one of the concerns was cost per transaction for the declarations. And I recall you mentioning uh, Robbie the Robot. <laughs> <laughs> the famous Robbie. He, he, he has an email address now, actually. We've, uh, we looked at robots and we looked at in integration into various software packages. We were going into, we, we realized we were going to spend about a year talking to software houses and still not be ready for day one. We decided to focus it back onto us and go down a process of RPA, robotic process automation, which is Robbie the robot. We've given him an identity just because people can associate with that a little bit more. And we've even got a campaign of Save Robbie. If you don't submit your master data, we're going to melt him. So it's this kind of, so it's this kind of process. Help us help you. And, and we've already started now with this process of transaction data when everything starts moving. How fast can, the, can Robbie the robot handle this? Uh, how repetitive is the process? And on the whole, about 85% of it can be handled without a human being. Now that's, we're still going to have 50 human beings. They'll be oiling and watering Robbie, <laughs> basically, just to keep the process going. But, it, but robotic process automation in a metronomic supply line flow in the eu they're made for each other yeah again if it was complicated containers from america and you know from some vietnam and something from china and the, it, that's complicated the tick tock tick tock of eu trade has got has got rpa robotics written all over it so we couldn't resist do you find that all this data convergence in the declaration processing is adding to the cyber threat uh, or is that not such a big issue? And Well, I suppose, I mean, Maersk had a cyber attack a few years ago and suddenly they didn't know where any containers were anywhere in the world. They've now mitigated that with blockchain and it's, it's a risk. You know, the, for, I have to say from the way we're handling data, it's probably less of a risk because it's less visible. We, we're only handling kind of bite-sized chunks because we've sort of dissembled it and, or, or disassociated it and then we associate it later when the truck's on the move. What does worry me, and this came up today actually, two, two quick big questions today with it when I was meeting with the client, was that um, you know, if you start to get to that situation where you load the truck and now you send the paperwork to the intermediary who does the entry and everything, that's, that's a list of everything that's in the lorry right now with all of the information about that, traveling around on the airwaves somewhere. And the other question I got asked about, and I really didn't have an answer, was I said, yeah, we need this information, we need that information. What about GDPR? Mm. Is the type of transaction level information we need to do the customs border processes, do you have the right to do that? I don't know where, it, it, customs trump GDPR? I just honestly don't know the answer. I, I think I, I would sort of add that uh, a general comment on cyber. If, if you change something and you put aggregation of data together, somebody will come along and take advantage of it. Mm. And whether it's through exploitation of devices connected by the Internet of Things, if you can get into a person's system via their refrigerated unit, or you can get into the navigation system on driverless vehicles or on shipping, or you have a situation as we've had with COVID with lots of office workers working at home where there are changes in the aggregation of data, somebody is going to be out there trying to exploit it. So wherever data is, bite size or big size, there'll be somebody looking 
and watching and waiting to try and attack it. And I can only see that particular risk is not going to go down the list of risks. That's still right up there. Number one risk for many. Um, depends yeah. on the sector you're in and what you do. So I think everything is vulnerable. Um, and sometimes you don't know it's vulnerable, uh, as Merce did, until a problem happens. I, th I think it's uh, sort of the most prosaic and building on what you've said. Uh, a number of companies, particularly in the manufacturing sector, have been seeing an increased penetration of ransomware attacks that's come through the CNC equipment. And if in the process of uh, developing your response to Brexit, you are exposing your core systems and platforms more and more in different ways that you hadn't before, it's just yet another door through which various nefarious stuff can come through. And it's yet another headache of security. Yeah, mm. uh, that's a very good point. Hmm. We've covered quite a lot of stuff now on the home straight, I'd say. Um, are there any other things that you want to talk about, sort of tariffs and expenses? And We're, we're quite a big fan of tariffs in terms of protecting the industry. Um, I mean, that's the point of tariffs, really. It, you know, they're not there because somebody's buying a lot of bicycles and the government sits there thinking, let's have some of the action. You know, it's, it's not how it works. It's, it's because you have a production and therefore you ring fence that with tariffs. I think there was a massive reaction to when the global tariff was, was released in May because everyone was on our case well, that there's going to be all these, all these tariffs on imports into the UK. And we had to keep going back and say that you've got to remember this was released in May. It's not applicable until January and we're in the middle of a negotiation. But I think it was a very good move by the UK government to actually say, look, this is our import tariff. And this will apply to imports from the EU if we don't have a deal. That serves two purposes. One is, is it encourages the EU to do some form of deal because we're starting on the same pitch if you like but also it shows to the eu that if we did a deal a tariff can also be used to ring fence the free trade agreement you have by protecting it with a ring of tariffs therefore if we if we do a deal with the eu without the deal the duty was 10 percent, but we've done a deal it's now protected by the 10 percent wall that is around that deal as well as our own production of that product so you know, they've got a place in life and i think they can actually drive industry and they can be quite successful for us they just got to be handled carefully. We don't influence them. We can't do anything about them. But I think yeah. the I think the UK has so far handled them very well. Most people rather they were nil, but they were quite proud of them in the arena. I think the thing I'd say is love them or hate them, they are around and they will change. And every time they change, it should be prompting people to rethink where and how they buy and how much they buy at one point of the goods affected. So I think it's going to be a a, a changeable picture that's gonna it's gonna be around for a little while mm -hmm. and a little footnote on the um customs classification just to, to, yes. to, to note that it's as much as an art as a science and uh getting professional advice on how to classify your goods um can save you a lot of money yeah i agree with that it, it's complicated mm -hmm. there are fifty-five thousand commodity goods yep we won't use all of those but there are yeah. certain times you know if in doubt then, yeah, I completely agree. I mean, the golden rule was always, what is it, what is it made from, what does it do? And if you can't find it with those three, bring somebody. I think we've um, got to wrap up now. It's been a brilliant conversation. Uh, we've talked about the, sort of the declaration processing challenges, the state of play through the lens of the supply chain director and the risk officer. Uh, we looked at sort of practical solutions for importers, practical solutions in terms of an approach to supply chain and risk mitigation. Uh, we talked a bit about Robbie the robot and uh, <laughs> <laughs> sort of the cyber threats, and some, of the, some of the hidden risks as well as some of the obvious ones as well. So I think it's been a really good uh, session. Uh, any final words? Any final words, anybody? Mm. I'll, I'll add one final word, connected risk and a lot of what my colleagues have described requires collaborative efforts. So the procurement manager, uh, people who are working on some of the issues associated with supply chain, uh, the risk manager, it's a team sport. You cannot run these things on your own because that's not how um, the supply chain or other risks work. They're all connected. So you need to be connected as well. And, and maybe building on that, it, it's a marathon and not a sprint. And this is going to be something that is going to be rehashed for many months to come. So, yeah, I'd, I'd absolutely concur with that. Well, that's good. Now I've got the pressure to come up with something equally prophetic. <laughs> yeah. That's uh... yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> pop, pop, 
Follow, following on the uh, the sport, you know, the sport metaphor too. Well, I do. My advice to everybody we deal with is play the hole backwards. Consider how the goods will arrive, not how they leave. Yeah. And if you can't get it in your mind that the goods will arrive, don't let them leave. Because they'll just, because they know they won't get there. I think that's great advice. Thank you. Yep. Good stuff. Well, thanks everybody for, for joining us. And yeah, hope you enjoyed it. No, I did. I really enjoyed no, it. No, that was excellent. <laughs> I really excellent. did enjoy it. <laughs> Yeah, but I think everyone's going to find it really valuable. So many lessons to learn there. Thanks very much, guys. Oh, that was fun. fantastic. Thank you, very much. Thank you very, very much. Good to meet you. Likewise. Good to meet you. Yeah, yeah like, <laughs> very much likewise. Okay, like, see you yeah. next time. Bye. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.